Well, if you would, let's stand together. We're going to sing hymn number 122 in our hymnals, Glorious is Thy Name. Blessed Savior, we adore Thee, we Thy love and grace proclaim. Thou art mighty, Thou art holy, glorious is Thy matchless name. Glorious, glorious, glorious is Thy name. Light of all eternal days, let the saints of every nation sing thy just and endless praise. Glorious, glorious, glorious is thy name. Just a couple of pages to hymn number 118. His name is wonderful. Let's sing that together. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He Master of everything, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty. sing that chorus again. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, He is the mighty 
mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Beautiful singing. Let's pray together. Pastor Pete, please lead us. Father, we have come today to proclaim that Christ's name is wonderful. It is majestic and holy. Father, there is none like you, none in heaven that we desire above you, and none like you in all the earth. You are utterly unique and transcendent from all of creation. You are so majestic and holy that we just simply want to come and worship you today, to lift up your praise before you, because you are worthy of it, Lord. So may you be honored and glorified by every single word, every single action, every single deed that we do today. May it be for your glory and your praise. We praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have a special treat this morning. This ha handsome young man right here is Daniel Jewett. And I always am thrilled when our children and our young people use their talents for the Lord. I'm especially talented. I'm especially thankful when our young men use their talents for the Lord as well, because somewhere along the line, we get the idea that it's somewhat less masculine to do uh, artsy things or singing. And um, I'd like you to mention that to King David when you get to heaven. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. What a blessing. And that should be the prayer of all of us that we decide right now to follow Jesus. No turning back. Well, we have a video to show right now. Of course, tomorrow is Labor Day, and we have a video that's entitled Labor Day, a celebration of work and rest. I am blessed to be given the ability to labor, to do good with my talents and efforts to give to my co-laborers with an open hand and honor our relationships with Christ's love. I am blessed to earn wages, to take care of those whom I love, to share with those in need, to give back to God a portion that He's so kindly given to me and to enjoy the goodness of life. 
I am blessed to have the strength of the Lord, to be useful in this world, to be used by God in big and small ways. I am blessed also to rest, to gather with those I cherish, to close my eyes and take the time to dream, to renew myself in the Lord once again. As I follow God from day to day, I will appreciate my work. It is my portion from the Lord and a gift. May God keep me occupied with gladness of heart, in work, and rest. Amen. So I hope tomorrow, as, as many of you will be off, that you'll take some time just to thank the Lord for the job that you have and for the rest that he's giving. If you would, let's stand together. We're going to sing once again a beautiful song. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Once again, think about His love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. As we prepare for the offering this morning, two prayer requests for you, especially as our school begins Tuesday. Be praying for all of our students, all of our teachers, that they have a great year. But especially this Wednesday, uh, the husband of our PE teacher, Kevin Bird, is having about as major surgery as you can have. It's gonna be 15 hour surgery down in Roanoke on Wednesday. So be praying for uh, Kevin and Danielle uh, as they are, are anticipating this surgery uh, and that God would bless that. Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would be with our students, with our faculty, with everyone involved with our school, with our parents, as they are anticipating a great year. We pray that you would bless them that you would encourage them, give them the strength to make it through each day, even when they seem like they won't. That you would just bless Temple Christian School this year, Lord. We do ask that you would be, especially with the birds, as they are anticipating this surgery, this major life-changing surgery on Wednesday, that you would uh, give them your peace, your comfort and encouragement as they go throughout this time. That you give the doctors a steady hand and wisdom as they perform the surgery, and that you would just bless Kevin and Danielle, Lord. We do ask that you would take our offering this morning, that you would extend it around the world through our missionaries, that you would use it here in this place to further your gospel, and that your name would be proclaimed throughout all the earth through what we give today. We praise in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you, Mary. John chapter 12 is where we are today. John chapter 12. It is Passion Week. Jesus has just come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as the triumphant Messiah, the Prince, as Daniel chapter 9 promised to the exact day. And it's Passion Week, the last week of his life. That's what we're looking at tonight, but bef- uh, this morning. But before the message today, Christina Anderico comes to sing, You Are Not Alone. searched for love when the night came and it closed in I was alone but you found me where I was hiding and now I'll never ever be the same It was the sweetest voice that called my name saying You're not alone for I am here Let me wipe away your every fear My love, I've never left your side I have seen you through the darkest night and I'm the one who's loved you all your life all of your life you cry yourself to sleep Cause the hurt is real and the pain cuts deep All hope seems lost With heartache your closest friend And everyone else long gone You've had to face the music on your own But there is a sweeter song that calls you home saying you're not alone for i am here let me wipe away your every fear my love i've never left your side i have seen you through the darkest night And I'm the one who's loved you all your life, all your life, faithful and true forever. Well, my love will carry you. You're not alone, for I, I am here. Let me away your every fear my love I've never left your side I have seen you through the darkest night your darkest night and I'm the one who's loved you all your life all of your Thank you, Christina. All right, picture this. The hour arrives. Picture this. You're in the 
Waiting room of the dentist office. <sighs> you don't want to be there. Everyone else in the waiting room doesn't want to be there. You're pretty sure even the dentist doesn't want to be there. As you're waiting, your head starts twitching. As you hear that grating sound of the drill being operated in the next room. and It's almost as if you can feel the, the prick of the needle in your cheek already. You're, you're, you're feeling a little faint. And, Take a deep breath. And why, why, oh, why did you have to schedule this appointment for today? Couldn't you have scheduled it for sometime, I don't know, next century? I mean, does, does anybody really need good, clean, solid teeth anyways? Didn't people survive for, for millennia without modern dental practices and hygiene and things? And, and, and suddenly with a start, you realize they called your name. Oh, or, or here's another one. Do you remember sitting in class as a teenager? There's nothing to do. Class is done being taught. You're finished with all your homework, or at least that's what you're going to tell your mom. And you're so bored, you'd rather be anywhere, even in the dentist office. You've been staring at the clock for 20 minutes now, and you're pretty sure it's slowed down so much that it's now moving backwards. There's just five more minutes, and then you're free. Free to run and play, free to do whatever you want. No more teachers telling you to sit and be still. You glorious freedom. First off, you're going you're gonna to stop by your best friend's locker, see what they're doing this afternoon. Then, then you're going to drop off those horrible school books at your locker. And then for the next six glorious hours, you're going to do anything you want. You're going to be outside. You're going to be on video games. You're going to be talking to people on the phone. You're going to do whatever you want. It's going to be great. If only that clock would start moving faster. Just five more minutes. Or here, here, here's, here's one last one. You've now reached the longest week of your seven-year-old life. It is December 18th to the 24th, just the week before Christmas. The most magical day of the year. You've already helped your mom put up all the Christmas decorations. The lights have been hung up outside. And you go and you flick them off and on a couple of times just for fun. The tree smells wonderful in the living room. And there's already a couple of presents sitting tantalizing under the tree. Oh, it's going to be awesome. And you are bored out of your gourd. You don't even have school to keep you occupied. You're sitting there on the steps playing with some of the Christmas decorations while your mom's favorite Christmas record is playing on the stereo. And all you can think about is Christmas morning. You're going to wake up early. You're going to run into your parents' room and jump on their bed and to wake them up. Say, get up, get up, get up, get up. And then, finally, the single greatest day of all the year will happen Christmas morning. Will your brother finally get that, that new toy that he's been Oh, so subtly hinting about all month long? Will your sister finally get that, that new doll that, that cries and realistically throws up at the push of a button? <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, just maybe there's going to be for you a new bike. It may be 32 degrees outside, but you're going to go racing up and down the street. This is gonna be, it's going to be amazing. Oh, Wow, you can't wait if only Christmas could be here sooner. We all understand anticipation, right? Those are fun, and, or in the case of the dentist, not so fun recollections of moments of anticipation in our lives where we've had to wait for something. We've all experienced that. We all know what it's like, but no one has experienced anticipation like Jesus Christ. He's been waiting for the moment of this passage that we're studying today since before the world began. Since before Adam and Eve sinned. Since before he chose Abraham and promised him a nation. Since before Moses led the people out of Egypt. Since before David was crowned king. Since before Isaiah promised a son would be born. Since Mary and Joseph held that newborn babe in their arms in Bethlehem. Since before John the Baptist baptized Jesus and he began his public ministry, he has been waiting for this hour. And that hour finally arrives. Four times previously in the book of John, we see 
reference to this hour in John chapter 2, verse, verse 4, at the wedding at Cana. Jesus' first miracle where he really begins his ministry. Jesus, his, his mother turns to, to Jesus and says, they're out of wine. And Jesus says in chapter 2, verse 4, says, said unto her, woman, not like disrespectfully, but he's changing that relationship saying, you're no longer going to be my mother. It's a different relationship. He's altering that relationship. He still respected her, still cared for her, still loved her. But he says, lady, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. In John chapter 4, verses 21 to 23, when talking to the woman at the well, Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father, ye shall ye worship what ye know not. Uh, ye worship ye know not what we worship. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. In John seven thirty, when the religious leaders try to take Jesus. John puts it this way, Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. In John chapter 8, they again try to take Jesus. He just claimed to be God himself, which he is. Verse 20, These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come come. Jesus was anticipating that hour, and here in John chapter 12, it arrives. It is the hour in which he would be glorified. So let's read through this section. John chapter 12, verse 20, down through 36. Verse 20, and there were certain Jews, uh, certain Greeks, excuse me, among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Verse 23. Jesus answered, saying, The hour is come, it's now, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this hour I came unto, uh, but for this cause I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came therefore a voice from heaven saying, I both glorified it and will glorify it again. Verse 29. The people therefore that stood by it and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how saith thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, A little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Finally, verse 36, While, we, while ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and hid himself from them. Now, I put the four main points of our outline in the bulletin this morning, but we're not going to get there. We'll maybe cover the first two because the, the more I, I dug into this, I mean, the, the, I, I, I shouldn't be surprised. And the, the scripture, the Bible is shallow enough for even the newest of Christians, the babest of Christians, babest of Christians to be able to walk through and wade into it and not have any problems. And yet it's deep enough for the most learned of scholars to delve its depths and never reach the bottom. And every time I went back to this passage, there was just more in there. So we'll cover what we can can cover and pick up the rest uh, in two weeks after Pastor's Challenge next week. 
We see first today Philip's individuals. Philip's individuals, verses 20 to 22. So they're at the Feast of Passover. It's Passion Week. This is probably Tuesday of Passion Week. Uh, maybe Monday, but probably Tuesday. On Sunday, Jesus comes in to Jerusalem, announces him, he's announced as the king, as the Messiah. Monday, he comes in and clears the temple of the money changers. Tuesday, he begins teaching in the temple. This is probably when this occurs. But certain Greeks that had come up to Passover, to Jerusalem for Passover, are there. And they would like to see Jesus. Literally, they want to have an interview with Jesus. But they, they can't get to Jesus. One is there's the crowd, and two, they're, they're Gentiles. These Greeks had come to Jerusalem. They were possibly Jewish proselytes, Greek men who had converted to Judaism. Uh, they may just simply be people who admired the Jews, who worked with the Jews, and therefore wanted to come up and celebrate with them during Passover. But either way, they asked Philip to see Jesus, to have an interview with him. It could be that they were standing in what is called the court of the Gentiles. See, in the temple of that time, there were four courts and then the temple building. There were four parts around it, kind of like an onion or a parfait. And as such, you have the areas in which people, certain people were allowed to go and, and not to go. There's first the outer court, which is uh, called the court of the Gentiles, and this is, was open to all people, all foreigners included. The, uh, there, were, there was one group that was not allowed there, uh, but, but every, everybody basically was allowed here. And this is probably where those Greeks were. They were in the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. The second court was open to all Jews. It was the court of the Jews. The third court, the, the, the court of, of the men, is, is just that. It was limited to male Jews who were clean and purified. So we see it's, it's open to everyone, then it's open to all the Jews, then it's open to, to just the men. The fourth court was limited to just the priests robed in their priestly vestments. Those that were basically on duty as a priest at that time. And then, of course, there was the sanctuary, the temple itself, where only the priests could go for service. And according to Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, says there was a partition made of stone all around the second court. So there's the court of the Gentiles where everyone's allowed to be. And then there was a stone wall uh, whose height was three cubits. So four and a half feet. I think it was about four and a half feet. Uh, the inner courts were on an elevated area ascended by 14 steps. So it was clearly delineated. In fact, signs were placed on either side of the steps going up to the, uh, the third court from the court of the Gentiles. And we found, archaeologists have found two of these signs, these placards. And on Greek is written, I'm not going to read it in Greek as well. Most of you wouldn't understand that. But translated into English, it says, no alien may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught on himself, shall he put blame for the death which will ensue? And they say, look, no admittance to Gentiles upon penalty of death. That's probably how we would say, or just, hey, you come in, you're going to die. Uh, Josephus further explains that Roman law actually allowed the Jews to execute any Gentile who entered that inner sanctuary, who went through past the court of the Gentiles into the court of the Jews. That was the one thing that they were allowed to execute people for. It doesn't say, notice that the, that sign doesn't say who is responsible for killing. It was, it was, they, they would really basically just grab the person in it in a riot, take them out and stone them. In fact, we see that almost take place in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 21, verses 26 to 30. Paul has been on his missionary journey and he brings some Jewish men with him back on his journey. It says, then Paul took the men, so he meets, he I'll give you the full background, he meets with the leaders of the Jerusalem church and they say, okay, this is great. We're all the united body of Christ. We're all the church 
Uh, and, and therefore, Paul, we have some men who have taken a vow. It may very well have been a Nazarite vow that we talked about on Wednesday. And they said their time is up. Take them, these men, Paul, to the temple and see them fulfill their vow. So Paul says, okay, we'll do that. So he takes these men and the next day purifying himself with them entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until all that offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him, they saw Paul in the temple, stirred up all the people. So Paul has come back from Asia from his missionary journey, and other Jews have come back from Asia for this feast that Paul is celebrating here. And they stir up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple, and hath polluted this holy place." They say, he's brought people past that spot where the Gentiles are supposed to. He is turning up all the world and talking against the temple and against Judaism. And we need to take care of him. And he brought people, he brought Gentiles into the inner sanctuary, into the inner courts. We need to stop this. Here's what they say, the next verse. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus an Ephesian whom they suppose that Paul had brought into the temple. They assumed that, well, they saw Paul with this Ephesian Gentile, this Greek guy earlier in the city, and then they saw Paul in the temple with some other Jewish men, and they say, oh, we're going to put two and two together and get eight, and therefore we need to kill Paul. Continuing on in Acts, it says, And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. They literally evacuated the temple. Everybody gathered around, grabbed Paul, they hoist him up on their shoulders, and drag him out, and they shut the doors of the temple. They said, no one else is coming in, so we make sure that only the right people are allowed in. And in fact, they were going to take Paul at that point and take him out and lynch him to, to execute him. But fortunately, uh, the Roman... Uh, the head of the Roman guard at that time from St. Antonia, uh, which is right next to the temple uh, grounds, saw what was happening, and he rushes out and actually saves Paul, takes him in, and the account continues on. But this is the closest account that we see in Scripture where somebody entered in and they were about to be executed. So these Greek men could not go out Uh, She could not go in to see Jesus. He was probably in the court of the Jews teaching the people there. So they asked Philip. Now Philip, like Andrew, was a Greek name. And that was pretty common in that day to have both a Jewish name and a Greek name. In fact, in verse 21, it says that Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, Bethsaida was right near the... Gentile region around the Sea of Galilee, known as the Decapolis, the ten cities of the Gentiles, and he, Philip, most likely spoke Greek. So if you are a foreigner in a foreign city with the foreign customs going on around you, you want to see one specific person in an area where you can't get to, you're going to find the guy who is following Jesus, who can speak your language and go to him and say, hey, Philip, We'd like to talk to Jesus. Would that be possible? They come to the disciple who spoke Greek. Now, the other disciples probably spoke Greek as well, but they come to Philip. Philip is a little unsure, so he goes to Andrew. Andrew was the fourth member of the inner circle of Jesus, who was Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. When you read through the list of the disciples in the Gospels, it's always broken up into three sections. That first section includes those three, Four names, Peter, uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew. It was kind of Jesus' inner circle, the ones that he poured a lot into. And then there was the next section of, of the, the four men, and then finally the, the next section of the four men listed there in the list. So Philip kind of like elevates it. He says, hey, Andrew, you're a little closer to Jesus. Could, do you think we should, should let these men come in and talk to Jesus? But he was probably hesitant for for three reasons. 
Philip probably remembered what Jesus mentions, uh, his admonitions in Matthew 10, verse 5, and Matthew 15, 24. Uh, 10, 5 says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. So when he sends the, the twelve out to preach the good news of the gospel, he says, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't even go to the Samaritans because it's for the Jews. I've come first to the Jews. So Philip may be remembering this saying, these Greeks want to see they're, they're not Jewish. Should we take them or not? In Matthew 15, 24, and he, that is Jesus, answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He, Philip knew that Jesus had come to reach the Jews primarily and first. So he's, he's a little hesitant. Secondly, he's probably a little hesitant because, well, it was undoubtedly hard to reach Jesus. And he wasn't unsure if he should interrupt him or not. You, I mean, he's, he's not the kind of guy to come barreling in and say, hey! Jesus, I got some guys here to, to meet you, and it doesn't really matter what you're teaching about Jesus. And, and part ways, move the crowd. I'm like Moses parting the, the crowd. You need to get out of the way so that these guys can get to Jesus. Yeah, they're, they're Greeks, and everybody here hates them, but they need to see Jesus, so get out of the way. You can see why he was a little hesitant. And third, he was probably a little hesitant, a little unsure of bringing these men to Jesus because, well, the religious leaders were around. And we know that they are looking for any excuse to take Jesus at that moment and take him and execute him. With Jesus' enemies around, it may not have been safe for these Greek men to be seen talking to Jesus. They may have gone in and talked to Jesus and then find a knife slipped between their ribs later by the, Jew, uh, the Jewish zealots saying, oh, no, we don't want anybody talking to our Messiah. Only, the, only us Jews get to talk to him. So those are, are Philip's individuals. And it's very interesting. They kind of prompt this hour to be declared. They prompt this passage and then aren't addressed again. Now Jesus may have been talking to them as, as he, 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 he talks in the next verses, but they're not mentioned again. Because instead, Jesus, rather than answering them directly, he starts talking to those who would follow him. So we see the purpose of the incarnation. The purpose of the incarnation. Uh, this is verse 23 to 28. And under here, we see first the announcement. The announcement, verse 23. And Jesus answered, and saying, answered them saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He announces, the hour that I've told you is not yet, it's not yet, it's not yet, it's here now. Pay attention everybody, the hour has come. But what exactly is this hour? Well, it's the hour of Christ's glorification. When the supreme work of redemption would be accomplished, it was the hour, it was the purpose for which He had come. Sure, we've seen his glory before in John 1 14 says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and then in John 11 verse 4 the previous chapter before he when, when he hears news of Lazarus being sick it says when Jesus heard that he said this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the son of God might be glorified thereby yes his glory has been revealed all throughout his public ministry all throughout his teaching, all throughout his authority, all throughout his miracles, but it's for this specific hour. This is the purpose of the incarnation, is for this hour, this glorification of Christ. This is the central point of all history, the grand turning point of the greatest story ever told. In fact, John MacArthur puts it this way, he says, significantly, just days before Jesus' own people verbalized their final rejection in the cry for his crucifixion, Gentiles sought to know more about him. And Israel's rejection of the Messiah would seal the divine judgment of God upon the nation. This judgment was foreseen by Hosea and Isaiah, uh, Hosea and, Isaiah and is further illustrated by Paul in Romans chapter 9 through 11. 
through this divine judgment, God basically picked up Israel and said, you are my prize, but I'm setting you aside. I'm setting you aside so that I can turn to the rest of the world. We see this in John 10, 16, when Jesus says in talking about the sheep and the sheepfold, he says, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also must I bring. They shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And that's, you'll recall when we were studying chapter 10, we said the fold that he's talking about there, the first fold is the house of Israel. The second fold here in chapter 10, verse 16, is the rest of the world, the Gentiles that he's going to bring to himself. And John 11, verse 52, says, Not for that nation only, in that Christ would die, one man would die so that one nation would not perish, and not for that nation only, but also that he should gather together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then Romans eleven twenty five. So this is Paul talking to the Romans, says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that the blindness in part is happened to Israel, or the judgment has happened to Israel, the hardening has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. This is what we call the church age. God takes Israel and sets them aside. And says, I'm going to reach the Gentiles and bring them together in the church as the body of Christ. And then when the church is removed, then he comes back to Israel. God is not ultimately finished with Israel. He will gather the nation of Israel back to himself. Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And, the, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Zechariah prophesied a time in which Israel would be set aside. They would be hardened. They would be blinded to how God is working. Until they finally turn back to Christ. And look at the one who, was, who died for them. And they mourn. They realize we killed our Messiah. And they mourn for him as one mourns for an, their only son. Zechariah 13, 1, just a couple of verses later, says, In that day, in that day there shall be a fount opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. In that day they shall turn to Christ and find salvation and the forgiveness of sins in him. Romans eleven twenty six 26 to 27 and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So yes, the hour has come for Christ to be glorified. He is about to be rejected. The public rejection of their Messiah. And God says, okay, Israel, I'm going to take you and I'm going to set you aside. And I'm going to set you aside until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Until you look upon me whom you have pierced and mourn as one mourns for the death of their only son. And in that day, you will look at me and you will mourn and you will find salvation and the cleanness, cleanness from your sins. The washing from your sins. And then I will bring you back. This does not, of course, preclude individual Jews from being saved during this time. But as a whole, as a nation, they shall not turn their hearts back to God until he draws them. As Zechariah 13.1 uh, says, in that day. So the hour has come. Christ is about to be glorified. It has arrived. The anticipation is over. Before we finish today, let's look secondly under here. At the abundance. The abundance, verse 24. He illustrates this. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So we see the announcement of the hour. And then we see the abundance of the hour. He says, verily, verily, listen up. Jesus is about to drop some truth on us here. Pay attention to this. If he says, 
If Jesus speaks, we should pay attention. If he says verily or truly, we should especially pay attention. If he says verily, verily, we need to be writing this down. This is truth. The question is, is how will Jesus be glorified? It's simple. It's by dying. He explains this through an illustration that everyone in their society, their agri- agricultural society, would understand is that a grain of, of wheat if you take a, a grain of wheat and hold it in your hand, you have a grain of wheat in your hand. It doesn't do much by itself. But if you take that grain of wheat and you bury it like it has died in the ground, and you tend it and you water it and you watch it grow, that grain produces much fruit. And that's what he's talking about here. And in contemplating this, I, I couldn't help but remember one of my favorite books. So I, I had to go back and grab it. It is Jules Verne. I, I was given this in high school. Uh, four books of Jules Verne. It is The 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, The Mysterious Island, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and Around the World in 80 Days in one volume. My favorite out of this is The Mysterious Island. And there's one passage in there. There's one scene in there that is always stuck in my head. In Jules Verne's Mysterious Island, during the Civil War, five northern prisoners of war escape during the siege of Richmond uh, by hijacking a hydrogen-filled observation balloon. What could go wrong with that? They hijack it in the middle of a storm and are blown uh, all the way across the world, land on the eponymous island somewhere in the South Pacific. These men are led by the genius railroad engineer Cyrus Harding. And as the book progresses, one of the men, uh, the men are searching for ways to survive. I think that's why I like it. It's like the the original survival story of of Survivor Man and and five guys on an island, they have to survive. But one happens to find a single grain of corn that has fallen into the inner lining of his waistcoat. And he pulls it out. Here's how it goes. It says, a grain of corn? The engineer quickly said. Yes, Captain, but one. Only one. Well, my boy, said Pencroft, the the sailor, laughing, we're getting on capitally. Upon my word, what shall we make with one grain of corn? We will make bread of it, replied Cyrus Harding. Bread, cakes, tarts, replied the sailor. Come, the bread that this grain of corn will make won't choke us very soon. Just one little, one, one grain of corn, that's it. Herbert, another of the fellows, not attaching much importance to his discovery, was going to throw it away. So, well, that's no good to us. But Harding took it and examined it and found that it was in good condition. And looking, the sailor full in the face said, Pencroft, do you know how many ears one grain of corn can produce? (laughs) One, I suppose, replied the sailor, surprised at the question. Ten, Pencroft. And do you know how many grains... One ear produces? No, upon my word, the sailor replies. About 80, said Cyrus Harding. Then if we plant this grain, at the first crop we will reach, we will reap 800 grains, which at the second will produce 640,000. At the third, 512 million at the fourth, more than 400 thousands of millions. There is the proportion from one grain of corn. These men who had no, very little food otherwise found one grain of corn and they, the, everybody said, well, we can't do much. Yeah, sure, we can grind it and make a tiny little cake. The, the man understood, Cyrus Harding understood the importance of one grain of corn planted in the ground and the fruit that comes out of that. It goes from one to 80. I'm sorry, one to 800 to 640,000 to 512 million to 400 thousands of millions from one. That's what he's talking about here. That's what Christ is saying. He says, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. 
This was the abundance that Christ was about to bring about from the incarnation. He says, look, I'm going to die. This is the purpose of the incarnation. I am coming to die for you. But in dying, I will be like that grain of wheat. I'll be planted in the ground and bring forth much fruit. Consider just how many millions and billions of people Christ reached because He died. He knew that His glorification could only be accomplished through His death. The cross is just the first stage of this glorification. It is the first step of Him returning to the glory that He had with the Father since the world began, as He says in John 17, 5, in His great high priestly prayer, He's talking to the Father. He says, "Oh now, and, and now, O Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self, with the glory which I had with Thee before the world was. D.A. Carson says it's not just that the shame of the cross is inevitably followed by the glory of the exaltation. It's not that, well, he's, he endures the shame and then because of that he gets the glory, but that the glory is already fully displayed in the shame. In that going to the cross, enduring its shame, at that point he's glorified. What does he say later? He says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The cross is the supreme manifestation of the glory of Christ. Because who would consider that? Who would ever imagine the God of the universe, the God who created everything, coming in human flesh and dying on the, in the most excruciating, most torturous way possible, hanging naked on a cross? What is that? That's the glory of God. That is the glory of God displayed for us. The cross did not catch God off guard. He planned it and orchestrated every part of it, fulfilling prophecy after prophecy. In fact, I read one article that listed out over a hundred prophecies that were fulfilled during Christ's first coming. The majority of that list were fulfilled at the cross. It did not catch God off guard. It's not that he responded, oh, wow, the Jews rejected me. What am I going to do now? It's the culmination of the redemptive plan that the Trinity put into action before time began. It is the very reason for Christ's incarnation to produce much abundant fruit. John MacArthur puts it this way. There could never be the establishing of his glorious kingdom with all of its features promised in the Scriptures without the cross. Anyone who thinks that Jesus came to offer His kingdom to Israel without the cross and and thinks that the cross was only a reaction because of Israel's unbelief is a fool. And he says that upon the authority of Scripture because after the resurrection, actually on resurrection day, as two of Jesus' disciples were walking down the road to Emmaus, Jesus meets them and walks with them. And in Luke 24, verse 25 to 27, it says, Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures of things concerning himself. Christ came for the cross. Christ came for the cross because he knew it was the only way of salvation. It was the only hope we would ever have by him laying down his life so that he might then take it back up was the only hope that his beloved humanity would ever have of escaping hell and finding a relationship with him forever in heaven. It's the only hope way so then church I have to ask you are we living up to it are we producing the abundant fruit hopefully we won't be required to give up our lives like Christ did but we should be willing and that's what he talks about as we will look at in two weeks of those that love him those that serve him 
what they will do in response to that. But for today, are we willing to suffer for Christ? Are we willing to face the hour that we have now and say, Christ, I'm all yours. You gave up everything for me and I'm willing to give up everything for you. What is that sin that we are holding back that we need to reach out our hand and finally let go? Peel off our fingers if we have to and say, Christ, it's not worth it compared to to you. You came for me. You endured the pain of the cross and the shame of it so that I might have life with you. Maybe you need to come to this altar in a moment. and Kneel down and simply pray and give up that sin. Give up that lifestyle. Give up that, that thing that you're holding on to so tightly. So that you might see Christ's glory in your life. There's something special about the altar. Sure, you can do it in your, in your pew where you are. But there's something about coming to the altar and saying, Christ, the world may not see me. The, the congregation may not see me. They may not, they may not know what I'm doing exactly. But I'm coming here. And I'm laying it down. I'm done with this. Christ has called us to live a life of holiness. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1 to be as holy as God is holy. And it's a shame for me to say that I don't. I have those sins in my life that I say, well, well maybe God will overlook this one. Maybe, maybe, maybe this one doesn't really matter. And I hold on to those. It's time to let go. Christ waited in anticipation of this hour when he would be glorified. He's now waiting in anticipation of the hour in which he will be glorified in your life when we give up everything for him. Let's bow forward to prayer as we stand together. Father, I pray that we would not hold back anymore. That we would give everything to you Because you are worthy of it, Lord. You know the absolute best for our lives. And that involves giving up everything to you. So Father, may we follow Christ's example. May we esteem Christ better than everything else. The one who gave up the glory of heaven and came and walked this dirty sod lived in our flesh never sinned and then died for our behalf died in our place upon our cross so he might redeem us he might free us from sin so father may we do business with you today may you call us to give up everything because you are always worth it. We praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The altar is open. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, Therefore I no longer live, Jesus Christ now lives in me. Service tonight starts at 6. We'll be back in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I believe we're starting uh, tonight. So that'll be 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
Uh, I hope you can make it for that. Enjoy your nap this afternoon. Marty, would you dismiss us with prayer? Lord, thank you so much that you came to this earth and you were willing to suffer on our behalf so that we could have a relationship with you and the Father. Thank you that you were glorified, and I pray that in our lives that you will be glorified as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.